My name is Zach. I'm here to talk about predictably fast closure, and uh, hopefully you learn a thing or two. Uh, so what happens when we call nth s2? We know what it returns. It returns the third element of the sequence, but how do we actually get there? If it's a vector, then we call closure lang indexed, which has an nth method. If it's an array, we simply look up the third element. If it is marked with the Java util random access interface, then that means that we can efficiently call git on Java util list, and so we do. If it's a string or some other sort of character sequence, we call char at, and then box at in a capital C character, because nth returns an object, not a primitive. But if it's none of these things, if it's just a seek, then we call next, and then next, and then first. And this can basically mean anything, because if it's a lazy sequence, we might be doing arbitrary computation. This might be as simple as walking a linked list, or it might mean that we're traveling to the moon and back again. And so we don't know what happens when we call nth. We only know what it returns. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Referential transparency is a property that any expression can be replaced with the value it returns without changing the semantics of the program. And this is something that we rely on quite heavily. It means that we can replace a function with a memoized version of itself. It means that we can treat lazy and eager evaluation as interchangeable. It means that we can map over a sequence sequentially or in parallel. But what about these? Here we map a function over sequence and then again map that same function over the sequence, but first we sleep for a second. These return the same thing, they're equivalent, but are they the same? And if so, what if we sleep for an hour or a day or a year? At some point we have to admit that the only way that these two things are interchangeable, the only way that they're equivalent, is if we have all the time in the world. And this is true of most applications of referential transparency. Memoization is only sound if we have enough memory to hold all the possible inputs and all the values associated with that. Parallelization is only sound if we don't exhaust one of the many shared fixed resources. Specifically in the case of a ring HTTP server, we can only treat all of the requests as isolated from each other we don't uh, if we don't exhaust bandwidth or file throughput or file descriptors or main memory or computational capacity. If we hit any of these boundaries, it starts to break down. It's no longer a sound way of reasoning about our systems. And so when we talk about referential transparency, it can't be as some sort of pure mathematical truth. It's a convenience. It's a lie. It's something which we use to gain leverage to reason about the complex systems that we build. And it has utility, but it also has boundaries to that utility. And this is true of pretty much any abstraction that we use. These are tools that we can use. These are things that allow us to build systems that are as complex as the ones we do build. And they have capabilities which we need to use, but they also have incapabilities which we need to be aware of. And so when we talk about the correctness of the things that we build, it can't be in some sort of abstract sense. It needs to be with respect to the problem that we're trying to solve, to the inputs that we're dealing with, the volume, every other sort of dimension of these systems. And if we don't understand the abstractions that we build atop, we can only say that right now things seem to be working. We don't know what tomorrow holds because we don't know what the breaking points are of any of these abstractions. And so I've called this talk predictably fast closure because closure is a language which values generality. It gives us these unifying abstractions, like the seek abstraction, which allow us to forget that for whatever reason, in Java, the way to get a particular element in a string or an array or a Java util collection is different. It allows us to reason at sort of a higher level within our programs with this generality is that tension with predictability. For us to understand what's actually going to happen when we are concerned about these sorts of shared fixed resources requires us digging a little bit deeper, understanding what actually happens underneath the covers. And so I could have also called this talk looking deep into the abyss, because we stand atop a tower of abstraction. Enclosure is just the topmost layer. Underneath that is Java. Underneath that is a JVM. Underneath that is 60 years of accreted abstractions. We're not going to get to the bottom. We cannot reason from first principles about these things. And yet, closure, despite being atop this tower, is actually a really good way to sort of peer down into it. Uh, I've been using closure for about five years, and I've become an immensely better engineer 
through the use of it because it gives me the tools. It gives me the REPL. It gives me access to all these Java libraries. It gives me access to wonderfully reasoned out abstractions. And it gives me a way to start to kind of dig down, to broaden my understanding, to make my understanding more nuanced. And yet, um, I'm never going to get it right. We're never going to get it right. We cannot, again, reason from first principles about this. First principles are out of reach. We need to think like a scientist. We need to have a hypothesis of how our system works. We need to build atop that hypothesis, and we need to be prepared for when that hypothesis is disproven. We need to monitor the systems that we build. We need to understand that this is an inevitability and that that is a thing that prompts us to, again, deepen our understanding of the system, make it more nuanced. And so to be concrete about this, I work for Factual. We provide an index of things in the world. And this means that we can be asked questions about what's actually in the world. I'm here, where are the nearest three coffee shops. But we can also take other people's data that relates to the real world and use our index to clarify it, to give it context. And so it turns out that my job involves a lot of taking other people's data, putting it somewhere to be processed, and then taking our sort of clarified, improved version of that data and delivering it back. And despite all this, despite the fact that you know, we are operating at a volume which by no means is the largest volume of anybody even in this room, but is larger than anything I've dealt with prior to now, and the fact that this can, with one or two new contracts, double almost overnight, I don't want to live in fear of this falling over. I don't want to be woken up at 4 a.m. and have to multiplex SSH into a dozen different Amazon boxes. That is not what I signed up for. And so my real responsibilities are in the course of building the systems that I build. I need to make sure that my understanding of the systems is in advance of where it needs to be at the bare minimum. I need to feel secure that when things change out from underneath me, that I am not on the cusp of things falling over. And so this talk is sort of taking the things that I've learned and trying to articulate them in the sort of time allotted, but also to kind of give you an idea of the larger uh, sort of mentality here, the, the way of thinking about these sorts of problems, and sort of give you a push in the right direction if you want to walk down the same path. And so let's dig a bit. What happens when we call count? Well, closure core count has an inline form, but really it just proxies through to closure lang RT count, which is a Java function. Closure lang RT count is pretty straightforward. It checks whether or not it's an instance of closure lang counted, which is true of a vector or a map or a set. And if it is, it calls dot count. Otherwise, it calls count from, which is a slightly more complex function, which has handlers for a string or an array or a Java util collection. Or if it's a seek, it walks it from beginning to end, counting one each time. And uh, the O equals null idiom here is to make sure that we're not holding onto the head of the sequence, if that's in fact what we have to do. And so looking at this, uh, it, we may sort of reason that uh, the cost of this indirection, the cost of this unifying abstraction is not that high if we're dealing with something which is a vector or a set or a map, because we have a function call in closure core count, which proxies through to a very simple function, which has a single if check, and then calls the function directly. And if we do a micro benchmark using criterium, this seems to be supported. Calling closure core count is approximately 10 nanoseconds. Calling dot count directly is about five. And you may notice that this is, in fact, twice as much time. But let us never forget that a nanosecond is not a very long amount of time. There are a million of them every millisecond. So any sort of non-trivial computation kind of makes this background noise, especially going to disk or going to the network. And so we can take this as a win. We have this unifying abstraction, but we're not paying a particularly high cost for it. And yet, uh, here is a more complex function, which I wrote recently, which takes an array and takes a vector and tries to find a matching subsequence within them. And the details are not important, but I've highlighted the fact that I'm calling count on the vector, and then again in the loop calling nth repeatedly on the vector. And this is taking about 200 nanoseconds for a 10 element sequence or a 10 element vector, rather. And uh, I knew that there was an overhead here due to this indirection. And in fact, this sort of process of discovery of what it is that we're actually calling count on is being repeated. We first discover that it is a vector when we call count, and rediscover again that, yes, it is, in fact, still a vector each time that we call nth. 
And I just wanted to get sort of a sense of the overhead. And so I replaced just the count. And all of a sudden, the, uh, it halved the amount of runtime. And so this call, this little bit of indirection that cost five nanoseconds just a moment before now costs 100. It's increased by 20-fold. And so you may well ask, what's going on here? And the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> um, but I do know something a little bit more general, which is that we have all of these things that are between us and what's actually going on in the machine, and they try their best to flatten indirection. The JVM inlines function calls. It has all sorts of JIT optimizations that try to do something similar. On the processor, we have branch prediction, which tries to make as if an if statement doesn't really exist, as long as we have sort of a predictably majority sort of outcome there. Likewise, we have the cache on the CPU, which tries to make it so that we don't have to pay the cost of going out to main memory so much. And there are countless other ex examples of this. And what this means is that all these things are great. They make us able to use these layers of indirection, these abstractions that, again, give us the leverage to reason about our systems. And they work wonderfully up until the point where they don't. And so the point here is not to sort of harp on count or any of the other abstractions that are in closure. I'm not questioning the utility of them, the necessity of them. But when we talk about performance, it cannot be in isolation. It can't be about an abstraction. A micro benchmark is not predictive of a more complex real world use case. And so we cannot simply measure different pieces of our system in isolation and assume that they will come together in some sort of clean way. It might be slower, it might be faster, but it certainly won't be the sum. And so I'm going to be talking about certain things. I'm going to be giving measurements in nanoseconds and take these for what they're worth, which is not very much. But with that said, uh, there is a common pattern when someone first uses closure and they're somewhat perf minded. And that is they take something that they've written in Java and they've been told that closure is based on the JVM and it uses Java bytecode or JVM bytecode. And so it should be as fast as Java. And so they write something in sort of idiomatic closure and they run it and they say, well, why isn't this fast? And then people sort of leap to reply and they answer and, you know, uh, golf away at the code. But usually one big part of this is that closure's numeric stack is a lot more forgiving than Java's numeric stack. And so we can add together two primitive longs, but we can also add together a boxed long and a primitive long, or things that don't even exist in Java land, like closure lang ratio. We can add together big integers and non-big integers, and it's a very sort of welcoming environment for math. And as a result, the arithmetic operators in closure are much more powerful than those in Java. They're much more general. A problem here, though, is that if we want to make sure that we are doing the fast sort of arithmetic, we have no way to know. And in fact, I gave a talk about a year and a half ago about writing a Go AI enclosure. And this was a problem which was almost sort of artificially concerned with uh, math performance. And I complained that uh, it was very hard for me to know what sort of math I was in fact doing. The only way for me to understand this was to attach a profiler and see what functions were being called, or take the code, compile it, and disassemble it. And I was putting these forward as almost sort of punitively difficult ways to understand what's going on. And that was because I did not know about a very nice library called No Disassemble, which was created by Gary Trackman. And contrary to its name, it allows us to disassemble classes. And uh, using it is fairly straightforward. We use No Disassemble. We create a function which does something. And then we disassemble that function. And we print out what's returned, because what we're getting is a pretty printed representation of Java bytecode. And it looks a little bit like this which looks a lot like a Java class, because of course a function is just that. And so here we see we have bytecode for the static initializer and for the constructor, which we don't particularly care about. We also have bytecode for the invoke method, which is sort of where all the magic happens. And so that looks like this. And if you're like me, you don't know what JVM bytecode really does. But it turns out that this is actually fairly easy to sort of reason our way through. We have the first bit here which is sort of a prelude. It takes the arguments and sort of puts them onto the stack in whatever order we need them. And we can kind of ignore this. This makes sure that the object is what it needs to be for us to be able to invoke the function. And Clojure will emit this before any such invocation. And this is, again, fairly ignorable. The JVM is very good at sort of taking this out when it doesn't need to double check. Here we have a bunch of static function invocations. 
which are sort of the meat of what's actually going on here. Here we take the object and we turn it into a primitive double. Then we uh, turn, uh, call the actual math.log function and then take the return value, which is primitive, and box it again. And then finally, we return that value. And so if we add some type hints here, and we type in both the input type and the return type as primitive doubles to match what's actually being returned and taken by math.log, the invoke function changes a little bit. Here it casts the object to a double and then calls invoke prim, which didn't exist before. This only is created on a function when we have primitive types in the input or output values. And invoke prim is pretty simple. It calls math.log. And so this is sort of an eminently inlineable form of a function. We can be fairly sure that the JVM is going to inline this for us, that it will remove this layer of indirection. And so this is pretty good. Unfortunately, uh, where we were able to coerce unknown types into doubles because math.log only takes a single thing, when we have a function which is slightly more welcoming, like math min, which will happily take a short or an int or a long or a double, we have to determine what to do at runtime. And so this, at the very bottom here, calls closure laying reflector invoke static method. And this is what happens on the compiler side when you see those reflection warnings. And the cost here is small but real. It's on the order of about one microsecond or a thousand nanoseconds. But if we call this with the plus operator, we do not get a reflection warning because Closure's numeric stack will happily accept all comers. And so here we call into closure laying numbers add. And at the top here, add will check the type of the first argument and sort of route into the appropriate operation. Here we assume it's a long. And so that calls into long ops add, which will get the primitive long value of each, and then call into add taking two primitive longs, which will finally add them together and then check for overflow. And if there is no overflow, return the value. And so this is what happens every time that we add two numbers together. If we have type hinted the input types, then that will happily call straight into the last function, the function which adds them together and check for overflow. And then because we have failed to type in the return value, we'll then box that value. If we type in the return value, again, we get this sort of very inlineable form. And this is, again, you know, a very nice sort of direct route into the math when we have uh, all the type ins situated. But this is still doing work that Java doesn't do. We're checking for overflow. And so if this bothers us unnecessarily, then we can use unchecked add. And we, here we see that we're not even calling into Clojure's underlying Java implementation. We simply get an L add or long add instruction. And so this, at long last, is as fast as Java. And you know, lest you think that unchecked add is some sort of secret path into performant math, uh, we can just as easily call unchecked add with untyped arguments, and it will happily go through that same sort of tower of calls. At the end, though, it just won't check for overflow. And so this is kind of a problem. Again, this generality is extremely powerful. But in the case where we don't want that generality, where we want to narrow the scope of the problem that we're trying to solve, it doesn't get us very far. We're not getting feedback. The reflection warning is a useful form of feedback, but we don't have anything which is sort of more nuanced than that. And so in pursuit of this, I wrote a thing called primitive math. And primitive math is a fairly straightforward library. It has a big Java file which looks like this, which resembles in some way closure lang numbers, except that it only deals with primitive values. It has one add that takes two longs, one add that takes two doubles, and nothing else. And it has some macros on top of that. So primitive math slash plus xy will expand out in place to a call to that Java function. And the reason for this is because we have two types of functions with the same arity, and Clojure doesn't allow for collisions in that form. And so uh, when we, again, have the same type-hinted thing where we type into all the different pieces, we again get this inlineable form. Sadly, it is not the L add instruction, because that is the purview of Clojure and Clojure alone. But again, this is sort of something that JVM is very good at. It will kind of bring this up and surface the L add from the underlying Java, and then maybe surface that again up into whatever sort of scope that is being called. And so this is of comparable performance to what we saw before, but it has a very nice property, which is that when we call it without all the requisite type hints, it will yell at us. And so 
Primitive math is not an attempt to improve on what closure does. It is an attempt to solve a much simpler problem and give us feedback when we escape the scope of that much simpler problem. And you know, some of you may see that I'm using Java and you think that, you know, hey, no fair, you told us this is going to be predictably fast closure and here we're seeing Java all over the place. But you know, this is what closure is. Closure is a Java library atop the JVM. And if we want to create, again, a narrower solution to a narrower problem, then using Java is often a good solution, at least in part. Another problem that I deal with fairly regularly as a result of all of the data that I have sort of shuttling back and forth is dealing with Java I.O. And this has become somewhat complicated over time. Uh, when Java first came out, we had byte arrays and input streams, but in around 1.5, they decided this was not enough. So we got Java NIO, which gives us byte channels and byte buffers. And then, of course, we have strings, which are not exactly bytes, but are sort of a representation. And so we have to deal with readers and all the other sorts of transformations. And the problem here is that going from any one of these to any of the other does not always have a direct solution. Often we have to sort of chain these different things together, and it's hard to do this well, it's hard to do this in sort of a general way. And after having solved this problem poorly about three different times in the form of making a util namespace where I added in the transformations I needed for that particular problem, I decided I was sort of sick of doing this over and over again. And so I wanted to do something a little bit more general. And so I wrote a library called ByteStreams, which traverses this graph and figures out what transformations need to be composed to go from any one point on the graph to any other. And this works pretty well. And we don't even have to traverse the graph each time because we can memoize that. We can turn it into a simply a composed set of functions that we go through each time. And so we don't even have to pay the cost of sort of minimally traversing this graph each time. Uh, a problem I ran into, though, is that some of these transformations, like going from a string to a byte array, are quite cheap. And memoization is, relative to this quite cheap transformation, a little bit more expensive. And I said before that nanoseconds are not a very big amount of time, but I want this to be a general purpose library, which means I don't get to dictate what sort of context, what sort of performance sensitivity is you know, necessary in this context. And so it's sort of, uh, as a library author, it's my role to either articulate where this library should not be used or make it so that it can be used in all different situations. And so I sort of wanted to understand why is memoization uh, relatively this expensive. And so I delved into that. And Memoize works more or less how you'd expect. It has an atom that contains a map. And then we get the arguments as a sequence. And we look up that sequence of arguments in the map. And if it's there, we return the value. If it's not, then we calculate it and put it in the map. And so understanding the performance characteristics of this requires us to understand what a map is. And um, this is actually a contextual answer. Uh, when we create an empty map, this gives us a persistent array map, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It is a flat array of alternating keys and values. And when we look something up in a persistent array map, we walk over the keys and one by one compare them with the key that we want to look up. If it ever goes over eight entries, then it will transform itself magically into a hash map, which will find the hash of the key and then walk down and do a certain number of hash comparisons and then do roughly uh, one equivalence check. And so looking at this, it seems like sort of the key thing that's going on here is, in fact, the comparison of the sequence of keys. And we can look at how two vectors are compared. And here we see that we first compare the sizes. And if they're not equal, we short circuit. But if they are the same size, then we create two iterators and we walk through them one at a time, comparing each in turn. And this is the only way to really do it on a vector of arbitrary size. But we don't really care about vectors of arbitrary sizes for this particular problem. We're trying to take argument sequences, which by and large are not that big. And so I wrote a thing which was focused on this very particular problem, which instead of trying to create something which is attempting to do better than vector, because that is not really a winning game, um, I tried to just solve this one problem of let's not make a general purpose uh, collection. Let's make one that is very specific. Let's make a particular collection which exists to hold nothing. Let's make one that exists to hold just one element and two and up to six, at which point, much like the persistent array map, sort of spills over into a vector because at that size it can do a better job. And so the comparison for two tuples uh, looks like this 
instead of comparing each field by iterating over it, it simply expands it out in place. It says, I'm going to compare my A to your A, your B to my B. There's no iteration here. The iteration is at compile time, because of course this is just a vector. This is not really closure that we're writing anymore. This is meta closure. And writing meta closure kind of sucks. Um, there's not very good tooling here. But uh, this is inarguably sort of a useful thing to be able to do. This is something that Clojure gives us that Java would never give us. And so I think that this is not a problem with the approach so much as a sort of tooling surrounding it. And I have some notions in this space. I haven't really had a chance to explore them out fully. If people have ideas or even an interest, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it more. Uh, one little oddity that I uh, found when I was writing this is that since vectors are not a seek, when we call first on them, we first have to wrap them in something that makes it look like a seek. And so calling nth v0 on a vector is, as we'd expect, quite fast. Calling first on a vector is about 10 times slower. And so one little change that I made is that the tuples are uh, both implement per, uh, persistent vector and iseq. And so nth and first are sort of comparably fast. So looking back at byte streams, uh, the sort of lesson that we can take away from it here is that let's front load the work. Let's memoize the work. Let's do the hard part once. And this has sort of two benefits. One is that it's less expensive across all the other uh, runs, but also that we don't have to be particularly performance minded when we're writing this run once code. We can write it expressively. We can write it without concern for sort of the overhead of all these things, because that cost is amortized across every subsequent run. And so this means that we can sort of split our code into the bits that are hard to write and hard to reason about, and the bits that are sort of less hard to reason about and generally more complicated. And this is good, because writing things that are performance sort of oriented everywhere is a pain in the ass. Uh, the things we can learn from CLJ tuple is that we don't even necessarily have to do it at runtime. We can, in some cases, do it at compile time. And writing code this way is, again, a pain. But uh, you know, I think that this can become better. So I work with Kyle Kingsbury, who some of you may know as Afer. And you know, he's written a couple things. He occasionally opines on distributed databases and how they don't quite match up to their marketing material. He has recently been writing an introduction to Clojure called Clojure from the Ground Up. And about eight months ago, we were getting lunch, and we were talking about local mutable variables. And uh, I was saying that you could definitely make a let mutable macro. That would be perfectly safe, as long as you just walked the entire body and made sure that certain invariants held true. And Kyle said, yeah, sure, I guess you could, but why on earth would you? And so that afternoon, um, <laughs> I wrote a library that did just that. And you may be wondering, my god, why? Uh, because you know, we have internalized why immutability is valuable. It gives us the ability to reason about our programs in a much simpler way, because we don't have to be concerned about who has the permission to do what. But of course, uh, this is sort of the most pessimistic interpretation of what immutability is supposed to do. Immutability assumes nothing about this, because anybody could be holding on to the same piece of data at the same time. If we narrow that a little bit, if we say that only one person is allowed to look at something, mutation is fine. This is what transients are. Transients are only allowed to be looked at, to be operated on, on a single thread. And so we don't have these same sorts of race conditions. And so when we look at what let mutable does, this is sort of an extension of that idea. Rather than enforcing this in a thread context, this is being enforced in a lexical context. This x that we've defined, which is mutable, cannot escape the scope, cannot be seen by anybody else. And so you know, it's questionable why we'd want to iterate 100 times and add one each time. But you know, this is safe. There is no way that we can have any of the sort of reality bending effects of uncontrolled mutability. And so what this looks like is you know, fairly straightforward. We create a container for this, which is a long container, because this is a, uh, un, like a not going to box the number. We want to have this be as efficient as possible, because we can. And wherever we see x, we expand that out into git x, except where we have the set bang, which expands out into set x. And the only sort of concern here is that if we close over this container, that it might escape. It might go off into some other thread, never to be seen again. 
And so we enforce that whenever we create a closure, that we turn the container into just the value. And so again, this is safe. This is bounded. This does not change any of the invariance that closure gives us. And so the main thing here that I want to sort of you know, uh, communicate about this library, and this library, by the way, is nothing. It's 100 lines of code. It was half a joke, half a proof of concept. Uh, people still use it occasionally. It's a little bit terrifying. But uh, <laughs> the point here is that you know, we have these sorts of very carefully engineered projects like Core Async or Core Type that do these very careful analysis of the code. You saw uh, Timothy Baldridge's talk, and it was very interesting. And there are really interesting things that can come out of this. But as long as you're willing to narrow the scope of the problem you're trying to solve, you don't need to over-engineer anything. These sorts of experiments are relatively simple to do. They don't have to necessarily be provably good ideas from the outset. Uh, there's a huge number of things that we can do in this space, which are, again, just narrow solutions of narrow problems that give us access to something that the closure core does not. And so the real message here <laughs> is that you don't have to have more insight into software language design than Rich Hickey to improve upon closure. You do not want, I think, to try to supplant the general solutions that he created because they're well made. But it's not hard to find a narrower scope where you can improve upon the capabilities that they give you. You just have to very carefully articulate what the scope of the problem is. And so there are a lot of other things I would talk about here if I had the time. Um, Vertigo is a library that takes a byte buffer, and as long as it has sort of a fixed layout, a la a C struct, allows you to treat that in 01 time as a closure uh, sequence, allows you to access it with the same sort of overhead and memory semantics as a C structure. Uh, immutable bit set uh, combines Java bit sets and closures immutable maps and uh, create something that for integer sets can be up to three orders of magnitude more memory efficient than a standard closure set. Automat is something that uses runtime eval to create a, an extremely efficient version of a finite state machine. Again, this is something that Java just simply cannot do. And Narrator takes fairly complex, mutable, statistical data structures, which cannot easily be made immutable, and allows them to be parallelized by putting them in a thread local context and then constraining the numbers of threads that can be used, putting it on a particular thread pool, and allows them to be combined. And so this sort of sidesteps the question of mutability and ownership. And so you know, try to understand what's going on. Don't understand for its own sake. Understand in the direction that you need to, to get out of head of the problems that you're trying to solve. But you know, dig down a little bit. Be curious. And if you want to do something in the spirit of what I've talked about here. You want to make a bounded solution to a bounded problem. Be very articulate about what that is, first to yourself and then to others. And if you're going for a general solution, then you know, have respect for what a big sort of problem that is, how difficult that is. And make sure that, again, you think very carefully about what that entails and how to accomplish that, hopefully by having solved the problem or a subset of the problem a couple of times beforehand. And so. I work for Factual. And at least in my own personal experience, um, the work that we've done has been a really great, great way for me to gain a deeper understanding of the systems, has in fact forced me to gain a deeper understanding of these systems. And so uh, if you have an interest in that, learning more about sort of both systems engineering and analysis, and being sort of forced by nature of the work that you're doing to gain a deeper understanding of engineering, I encourage you to come up and talk to me or any one of the, I think, 12 people from Factual that are here at the conference, and we'll happily talk to you more about that. And with that, I'll leave the floor open to questions.